Mm -hmm. I'm Jim Beggs. I was born in 1929 during the Depression years. I've been married for uh, just on 58 years. In 1951, when I'd just turned 21 years of age, I got a job on the waterfront in Melbourne. And I remember my first job well. It was a midnight shift at 16 South Wharf. And as I walked up the gangway, I wondered to myself as a young lad who'd been brought up in it with a very strong Christian background, what am I doing on this, in this industry? I've joined the most militant union in the country, well known for its strikes, its violence and pilfering and all the things that uh, the media had uh, written up quite largely about. Little did I realise that uh, 20 years later I would become the president of this the most militant union in the country. During the war, they couldn't get people to work in that particular job because it was such a, a filthy job. And so they went up to our local jail and offered the prisoners who were coming out of the prison system a job. It was casual work, a protected industry during the war, um, and just what a, a person who had a criminal nature delighted in so they gradually brought so many of their people down they took that union over and I mean in my 42 years on the waterfront there were something like 40 murders so it was a pretty uh, tough industry hmm. and of course the wages were poor the hours were irregular and of course the work was very dangerous hmm. half our members every year were injured so is it any wonder that that industry my generation didn't want to see that repeated. We wanted to improve. We got married in 53, my wife and I. We bought this block of land with a brick garage in it and we were building our own house. We had one child in the brick garage and one on the way when we uh, finally partly moved into the house. It took us four years to build it. I got home one night and started to work on the house and as it started to get dark, I would knock off. But this particular night, the neighbor's side light, a big light he had on the side, reflected right across our block. So it gave me another hour or more that I could finish what I was doing. And then a few nights later, the same thing happened again. And over the next couple of weeks, uh, this happened on a regular basis. So I realized it wasn't by coincidence, hmm. but that my neighbor who could see that I uh, gave me a chance to, to hmm. work longer on my block. A few weeks after I, we met our neighbor, he put his head over the fence and introduced himself and uh, that conversation changed my life. He asked me where I worked and of course my wife and I were very hesitant to tell anyone that I was a wharfie because of the reputation that we had. Turned out he had, a, um, he had an advisory role for one of the stevedoring companies. As we talked about the industry and he showed a real interest, after a while he said, uh, did I want to see the waterfront different? We just had a three week strike, which was very costly to me and my wife and, and all the other doctors, mm. Wolfies, because uh, no wages for three weeks leave you pretty desperate. Mm. And um, I said, yes, I do. He said, well, where do you think it should start? So I blamed the bosses, of course, and said that they uh, uh, just treat us as numbers and, and, and uh, exploit us. And I said, also the union. The union had five different political points of view on it and they fought each other as much as they fought for us. Mm. And I blamed these two groups. And my neighbor said quietly, after a little while, he said, uh, well, maybe it could start with you, Jim. He told me about his own story and how as an accountant, he'd, he'd uh, decided to make uh, people's taxation reports honestly, according not just to the law, but morally. Mm. And it turned out that he knew quite a few of the wharfies down there, particularly the leadership because he, he had a mission in life, Tom, to build bridges between workers and employers. Then after a while, he asked me an unusual question, did I believe in God? And uh, I had to struggle with an answer to say, yes, I do believe in God, but I, did, I said that. He said, well, you know, God's got a plan for everyone. He said, and uh, my wife and I, we just take time every morning to be quiet and listen to uh, whatever you want to call it, your conscience, your inner voice, uh, God or whatever. And he said, we get thoughts that help us through the day, you know, apologies to be made for what mistakes we made, etc. 
and he suggested that um, if I really am serious about wanting to do something on the waterfront, I might try the experiment. So when we concluded our conversation, I went over to in our brick garage where we were living and said to my wife and told her about this conversation and this thing of guidance. And my wife jumped at the idea. She said, well, we're having our share of rows and fights here in this garage. Uh, it sounds like a good way to start the day. Mm. So we tried this experiment and it became a turning point in our marriage. We were honest with each other about many things were just molehills that built into mountains. Mm. I had to tell her uh, when I'd been working on a ship and I'd get home at five o'clock at night and uh, half past five at night, what sort of a day, oh, a busy day. But little did, little did she know that I had been, um, the, the ship had finished at 10 in the morning and I'd sat there for the rest of the day playing cards with the fellows. So mm. we got these little issues out of the way and we began mm. to find a new love and trust for each other. And then we realised that we ought to uh, do something about our extended family, the wharfies that I work with. Mm. So that was the mission then that uh, we both took on. So uh, we then began to get thoughts about people on the waterfront. Apology I needed to make to a leading Catholic because I had real feelings towards Catholics as uh, my father came from the north of Ireland. I always accused the boss of being dishonest but it never stopped me from thieving his car cargo. Mm. And I had a, uh, a very strong thought one morning that I should return what I had taken. And I must say, uh, it's very hard to thieve something off the waterfront, but to take it back, I uh, believe you me, is twice as hard. <laughs> and uh, one of the things was a clock I took back and uh, uh, I went and gave it to the general manager of Austin Distributors. And it was a clock I pinched out of one of their cars. Mm. And uh, he was quite surprised. He, sh he said, well, you know that 90% of the clocks and windscreen wipers and hubs and everything that's removable on a car disappears. And um, he said, what, what would make a fellow like you bring this clock back? So I told him of my experience and my discussion with my neighbour and, and that I was committed now to build a new spirit in the industry. Mm. And... Uh, he said, well, I don't know what I'm going to do with the clock, he said, but I wish you all the well, all the best in what you're doing. And I think when I left his office, I could have lost my job, as many of my mates said to me before I took it back, mm. and could have uh, affronted the police mm. uh, on a charge. Um, but as I left his office, I, I, my faith had grown, mm. and I felt that here was one person I think I might have helped change his attitude to, to Wharfies. And of course... Uh, uh, my nickname then became Daylight Savings because I put the clock back. And of course that led to other things as well. I mean, my apology to this Catholic was quite a remarkable experience. Mm. He was a professional boxer, hated the communists, um, and often had fights with them and knocked them out at stop work meetings. Most of the uh, people who opposed the communists on the waterfront were Catholic labour men, good mm. Irish Catholic labour men. My bigotry towards Catholic refused to let me vote for the the Labour men, I voted for the Communists for mm. four years. Mm. And um, so when I went and apologised to this Catholic for uh, my attitude uh, and that I'd worked and voted against them, uh, and I said, I'm sorry. I said, as Christians, we ought to be working together. Mm. I said, our division at, at this point, a uh, split had happened in the Labour Party and all the Catholics had been thrown off the executive and the Communist unity ticket took over. Mm. And uh, now I never thought that this apology would have much of an effect on the waterfront. But you know, he came to me three weeks later and told me a story. He said, Jim, and he was a converted from Protestantism to Catholicism. And of course, they're much stronger in their beliefs. Hmm. And if anyone dared challenge the Pope or the Catholic Church, they'd have to knuckle up with him. He wasn't that sort of bloke. And as I said, he was a professional boxer. Anyway, he... Um, and he was in charge of 600 coal workers, which were even tougher men than the painters and dockers, not in the criminal sense, but in the physical sense. And uh, anyway, this particular night after I had apologised to him, uh, one of his colleagues was having a go at the church and the Pope. Smithy was his name, and he said to Smithy, if you don't shut your mouth, Smithy, I'll shut it for you. Well, Smithy was no cream buff like me. He used to say it to people's face. So I said it behind their backs, but... Mm. 
So Smithy kept up and, and it resulted in a fight and they had to carry Smithy out on a tray and uh, get the first aid to him. And Les said, he's telling me this story, you see, and he said, uh, you know, about three weeks later I got Smithy on the job. And uh, he said, I remembered your apologies to me, Jim. And he said, I thought, should I or shouldn't I apologise to this fellow for the fight the other night? And he thought, uh, I'll get him a smoke on, I'll quietly say, look, I'm sorry. But then he said, no, you had the fight in front of all your colleagues, go and apologise in front of them all too. So in front of all these tough colleagues, he walked up to Smithy and he said, I'm sorry, Smithy, about the other night. I was supposed to be the Christian amongst us and I didn't act like one. And, and he's faced it up and he said, Jim, you have no idea what happened then. He said, Smithy grabbed my hand. He said, Les, if, if you really mean what you've just said to me, I'll never say another thing against your religion. And those blokes became the best of mates for the next 26 years they spent on the waterfront. And Les learnt a lesson that night, how to turn an enemy into a friend. Hmm. And he lost his hatred of the communists. He even used to go up to them and say, look, I used to knock you fellas out of stop work meetings. When you come to, you're still communists. Les's change led to the change in the national leadership of our union because a few years later he became the major campaign speaker and organiser for um, a new general secretary. Hmm. And he won the elections and uh, even the new general secretary said, you were the one that turned the tide, Les. He then incidentally went on to become our, our president, our federal councillor and our uh, secretary mm. of the Melbourne branch for nine years after that until mm. he retired. Mm. As Les and I began to get to know each other better, we had began to get people on both sides of the industrial fence on the waterfront of the different groups uh, to talk to each other and we had meetings in our homes and we had meetings down on the docks with them and uh, we began to build a bit of a team and um, when our general secretary had died, everyone said another communist will take over. So we had a Labor man put his hand up and we decided to support him. And in our campaign, uh, we, we said now we're going to run this campaign honestly on the basis of uh, not left or right, but straight was our candidate's policy. Mm. And uh, one little story I'll tell you because the campaign was quite a successful one. Uh, there were hiccups and some fights, but this particular day we were following the pay card around the port to collect money for our candidate, which is the normal thing, and you line up and the wharfies come off the ship to collect their pay, and um, you stand there with your hat trying to convince them that your candidate's the one they should contribute to. Mm. And then there was the opposition there who were no cream puffs either, and one of them was a contender for the heavyweight title of Australia. So you were in a fair difficult situation asking Warfish to put into your hat as against the others. And this particular day, the opposition's car broke down and normally it had driven off and uh, collected the lot for that day. But the driver in our car, who um, didn't know much about what uh, Les and I were standing for, but he knew that he was two fellas that had been the opposite in the port were now working together. Hmm. And uh, so he pulled the car up and said to the opposition, give us your two best men. And uh, he got two out of our car and said, if we're going to win this campaign, we're going to win at Fair Dinkum. So as two blokes got in from their side, one of them said, you know, we'd never stop for you people. And the amazing thing was that three weeks later, at the end of the campaign, he was handing out our How to Vote card. <laughs> and that was the spirit that we created in mm -hmm. our candidate one and he took our union from the brink of anarchy back to the centre of the road. Hmm. And when I started on the wharf, uh, my union represented 2% of the national workforce, hmm. but 27% of the national strikes. Hmm. When I retired, due to the leadership, particularly of this uh, Charlie Fitzgibbons, the new general secretary, hmm. um, we still only represented 2% of the national workforce, but less than 0.05% of the national strikes. Hmm. Strikes had gone down, productivity and wages had gone up hmm. and a new spirit had been created hmm. in the industry. And I look back and I just uh, wonder, would that have happened if I hadn't apologised to this hmm. Catholic friend? Hmm. So when Les, this Catholic, decided to retire uh, because of ill health actually, uh, as president, I decided to stand. Hmm. And uh, I put my hat in the ring. 
I won by 45 votes simply because the opposition had put two candidates up against me. Hmm. So uh, I snuck up the middle and very lucky too. So I went on to an executive that was pretty anti me though. Um, they didn't like me because I'd knocked off their two blokes and um, uh, because it was a by-election I had two years to go. Hmm. And I had two years to prove to the wharfies that I was worthy of the job. Hmm. So I decided to really uh, take on the job on the basis of what I'd learned through these ideas of, of initiatives of change. And uh, just before I left for work to go to start my job as president, the union rooms, I was very nervous and because there'd been a lot of things said about me that was lies during the campaign and I felt very angry towards the executive. And my wife said to me uh, just before I left that morning, well, are you going to be uh, the sixth different point of view on that executive? And, and we stopped and had a time of quiet and listened. And we both had similar thoughts that A, if I'm going to be chairman of the executive, not to take sides uh, as a fair chairman. And the other thought was to treat the executive as if they were my brothers. Now, I thought I could handle the first thought, but the second one was going to be pretty difficult. Mm. But, you know, by the time I got to the office, I had lost my bad thoughts about these fellows. Mm. And I said, these are your brothers. Now, when I went into the office, not one of them shook hands with me and congratulated me. They all told me to keep my uh, um, moral armament and Christian ideas out of the union uh, and um, all that sort of stuff. And I thanked them for their advice and I just said to, to them, if you feel as president I'm not uh, doing the job rightly, I hope you'll have the, the honesty to come and tell me. Mm. At the end of the first 12 months in office, um, and my wife used to come in occasionally and one of the first of the wives to come and meet some of the other officers and uh, so we got to know them a bit better and uh, at the end of the first 12 months we decided as an executive we would have a Christmas party and we would invite our wives along and we took them to a restaurant and uh, as the first time it ever happened so when we arrived at the restaurant he was my greatest opponent, the one who fought the hardest to keep me out of office and also gave me that advice in the very first day. Uh, was standing out the front with his wife. He said, Jim, come and have, sit at our table. So as we sat down and began to have the meal, he said, you know, Jim, I've been on this executive for nine years, but for eight of those years, I've hated the job, the backstabbing and the fighting that went on in that office. Is I. But he said, since you've been there in the last 12 months, uh, there's a new spirit there, he said, and I haven't enjoyed my job so much as I have in the last 12 months. 12 months later, when the elections came round, he was on another ticket to me, but he was going round the waterfronts telling to the wharfies, if you don't vote for Beggs, you're stark raven mad, and you should be thrown in the river. <laughs> and of course, uh, I had a tremendous win, the largest majority anyone had been elected with as president. And I stayed there for the next 22 years, the longest serving president of my union, Mm -hmm. And uh, six years before I retired, I was elected the national president of the union and, uh, and saw it through some of its difficult days. Mm -hmm. My last three years on the waterfront probably um, uh, saw one of the major changes in our industry because technology was coming in and uh, our membership was obviously going to be declined. And um, we had um, been challenged by the government to reform the waterfront. We were given three years to reform it and uh, Bob Hawke was the Prime Minister. He sat the employers down and he sat us down as union officials. He said, I, I want to see these reforms work. I'll give you three years to do it. And if at the end of that three years you haven't done it, he said, I'll bloody do it for you. And he, uh, he was serious and we knew that. So we really sat down and we had in that period of three years, 300 meetings with the employers, the, uh, our members, our delegates, the stakeholders in the port, the port authority, the ship owners. And mm. at the end of three years, we introduced a scheme that in my opinion was probably the best industrial agreement that any union had signed. And uh, as a result, we saw productivity go up in our ports around the country over 100%. 
all our older men were paid out on a redundancy that was respectable and, and gave them some uh, dignity as they left. Uh, we opened up the waterfront for career paths because in my day you came on as a dock worker and uh, 42 years later I retired as a dock worker really hmm. but these new breed that came in uh, could start at the bottom and work their way up to the manager of the company or the port if they had the ability hmm. uh, and we saw um, and during that period of time there was no stoppages no bloodshed hmm. it was a, a negotiated agreement hmm. and um, and as I say uh, it saved the industry something like $300 million a year in increased productivity and uh, and the uh, incentive and productive screens we put in place hmm. 